Lord, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, fellow redeemed, do you remember when your parents first handed you the keys to the family car? There you are, 16 years old, brand spanking new driver's license, and there your parents are nervously handing you over the keys to the car, placing them into your small childlike hands. You remember what your parents said to you when they did this? If they were like my parents, it was probably something along the lines of, remember, wear your seatbelt, always check your blind spot, always obey the speed limit. When the light turns, make sure you wait a few seconds, make sure the intersection's cleared before you go into the lane. Driving is a, I guess, the most dangerous activity that most Americans will ever participate in. It comes with great responsibility and there's great power behind those keys that your parents give you. So when they hand them over to you, it's important that they remind you of the responsibility and they give you some of these reminders, even if you don't want to hear them. And the catechism theme for our sermon this morning revolves around the ministry of the keys, the most important keys of all. I think we don't often think about these keys by name. They're probably, of all the six sections we're going through these six weeks, this is probably the one we think about the least. But it's something that we use very frequently. Jesus describes them as the keys of the kingdom of heaven. In John 20, we already had, we've already said this in our um, confession of faith. In John 20, Jesus explains to us just what the, key, the ministry of the keys involves. He says, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. That is what it is right there. Either forgiving the sins of repentant sinners or not forgiving the sins of those who are obviously impenitent. Amazing as it may seem, much like a loving parent entrusting their child with the keys to the car, Jesus has entrusted us, his church, with these very important keys. It's astonishing that he would place the keys to heaven in the palms of small, sinful human children like us. But that's exactly what he does. These keys come with great power and great responsibility. And it's important that we use them. So our theme for this morning is, the keys are in your hands. Remember the love behind this power, and remember the responsibility behind this love. We'll consider that as we read through our text from Matthew chapter 18, verses 7 through 20. Woe to the world for temptations to sin, for it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out, throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of that one that went astray? And if he finds it truly, I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, 
it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Last week we studied Jesus' baptism, and at his baptism that kicked off his three-year ministry in Israel. This text is coming at the very end of Jesus' ministry, so we've jumped three years ahead. Very soon, Jesus will be going down to Jerusalem for the last time, where he'll suffer and die. And so now, while he's still with his disciples, he has some very important instructions to give them. Verses just leading up to our text, uh, Jesus was talking about little children, and he brought a little child in front of the disciples, and he said, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. As I read through the text this morning, I think Jesus is still trying to show this picture of a child and the fact that God wants all children and wants all people, really, to be saved. So you can ha- can't help but picture Jesus with the child bouncing on his knee as he's saying these next words to his disciples. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, Does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it truly, I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. The keys are in our hands. They're not just the keys to the family car. No, these are the keys that open and close heaven itself. It's very telling before Jesus actually gets into the nitty-gritty and, and what is involved in the, in the office of the keys. He shows us the attitude behind our use of them. Whether we are opening or closing heaven, it's all down, out, done out of love. Because as he says, God is not willing that any of these should perish. Now speaking of keys, when's the last time that you lost yours? Isn't that just the worst feeling in the world? You're, you're running late to work, you're tearing through the house, you're yelling, you're trying to find your keys. You look in all the usual spots, the bin, the hook on the wall, you even go to your pants that you'd thrown in the laundry last night. And finally, when you find your keys, is there any, any greater sense of relief and joy knowing that you hadn't accidentally left them somewhere else? We are all, when we were born, lost just as lost as any set of keys ever was. And Jesus, when he came to earth, he had a very particular mission. In his own words, he said, I have come to seek and to save that which was lost. And that's what he did for you. Not only did he come here to suffer and to die in your place, he also came and he made sure of it so that you would receive God's word and you would come to believe in these promises. He came to seek you out when you were lost and to find you. You were the lost keys for which he would not stop searching until he'd found you. You were the lost sheep for which he left the 99 and found you specifically. And now, before the Lord, when God looks at you, he rejoices. He has joy in his heart over every single one of you, knowing that you were lost but you're now found. You were dead in your sins, but now you are alive. Even when God sends someone else to come to us, to reprimand us for sin, this is done out of love because he is not willing that any one of us should perish. Rather, he'd want us to come to repentance. This is the same thing he asks you to do for your fellow Christians. Actively using the ministry of the keys involves seeking out the lost or those who are in danger of becoming lost. Specifically, when we use the ministry of the keys, sometimes we have to go and talk to people about sin. It's not fun. Sometimes it's hard to see the love in that. We say love is behind this entire thing, but when you're going and you're approaching someone and you you tell them, hey, what you're doing is wrong, that kind of sounds judgmental. It doesn't seem very loving at all. But it is done out of love. 
especially when you realize what God thinks about sin. Verses 8 and 9. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the fire. And if your, hand, and if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. Now, God's not asking us to physically dismember ourselves or to cut off our limbs. He's using this really gory and graphic picture to illustrate just how dangerous sin is. Sin has the power to lead the sinner to hell. Yes, Jesus did die to forgive us from our sins. But if we sin and we're okay with it, and we're willing to just continue on in our sin, that is a sign that it's either a dwindling faith or a lack of faith entirely. And if that's the case, then we might as well have just spat on Christ's cross. Because who cares about it? We reject the forgiveness of sins. This is the danger, the very real danger behind sin. And so you see, as we seek to find the lost, the most loving thing that we can possibly do is to help one another recognize sin in our lives, to point out sin, to have the very difficult and awkward conversation. It would be a really hateful thing and a shameful thing if we decided that we had rather just let someone go to hell than to make an awkward situation and approach them about sin. That's not what Christ did for you. He did not let the shame and the pain and the agony of the cross dissuade him from saving you. He was not concerned that you might reject his word when he came to you and pointed out your sins and also assured you that your sins had been paid for. Jesus had one thing in his mind, that you were lost, and he did not want you to die and go to hell. So he sought you out, and he found you. And now in the ministry of the keys, he simply asks us to do the same for everyone else. The keys are in your hands. They're powerful, but they're used in love, and they come with great responsibility. As verse 18 of our text reads, Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. What's your key ring like? Can you picture your keys right now? Can you feel the weight in your hand? How do they feel in your pocket? Are you the type of person that carries around every single key and extra key chains and maybe a lanyard and those, those little the store reward card things that you hook on there? Or is your key ring more of the just a couple keys, house key, car key, no nonsense? The key ring which Jesus hands you today in the ministry of the keys has just two keys, nothing else. The keys are used one for locking and one for unlocking and opening. First, we'll look at the binding or locking key. With this key, we actually lock heaven. There's an example in scripture of this key being used. It's in 1 Corinthians. And there was a, evidently there was a man in the church at Corinth who was living with his, his stepmother in a sinful way, in a very sinful way. And he was okay with it. He had no intention of changing. And the Christian congregation there, they all knew about this lifestyle but none of them would say anything. So Paul comes to them and he speaks to them in chapter 5. and says, purge the evil person from among you. He's saying, cast him out. Excommunicate him is what he's um, prescribing them to do. This is being done out of love. He's trying to shake the congregation into action. And not only that, he wants to shake this, 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 sinner, this sinful man who's totally content in his sin, to shake him awake and cause him to repent. And it works. The congregation hears this reprimand from Paul and they go to the man. The man hears about his sin, he recognizes he's done wrong, 
and he repents, and he believes, and he's rejoined with the congregation. This is when the binding key can also have really wonderful results. And we pray that's what the Lord does when we have to use the binding key as well. Now, earlier this month, Jess and I went to the, the pediatrician's office with the boys. They had to get their one-year shots. And you've, some of you have probably been there before. You know, I don't remember what the shots they got, but they got one in each arm and then one in one of their legs. And if you've experienced this, it is not fun. The babies start screaming and crying. They're in pain and agony. You don't like to see it. But as a parent, you know that the little bit of pain now is going to be much better than the greater pain that could come on down the line if they were to catch one of these diseases. So for the moment, we deal in tough love. It is love. It is painful. But it is the better alternative. Similarly, as the Christian church, you and I, God has given us this binding key, which a lot of times is just tough love. We deal with one another with compassion. And sometimes it hurts. Sometimes it is painful for the person that we have to approach. But the small amount of pain now is much more preferable than an eternity of pain in hell. So we use the tough love of the binding key with one another. And Jesus tells us how to use it. Verse 15, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. When it comes to dealing with someone else's sin, none of us are comfortable with that. That is not a fun conversation to be had. And it's hard to find the right words to say. Even for a pastor, it's difficult and unpleasant. But we still have to do it. And when you find out about something, you don't need to come to me and ask me what to say. Because Jesus tells us right here exactly what to do. Go to that person. And it's good to pray about these things. But don't let praying for them be the only thing you do. Because in this conversation with God that we have through prayer, God's answer back to you is recorded right here. Go to that person. Show them where they've gone astray. Tell them that what they are doing is wrong and sinful. It's as simple as that. Sometimes they will refuse to acknowledge their sin. They'll refuse to admit that they've done wrong or repent. In times like these, we need to administer the tough love. We need to use the binding key and warn them very sternly that if they reject Christ's forgiveness, heaven is already locked to them. But other times, as with the Corinthian congregation, we use the binding key, we show people their sin, and thankfully they hear and repent. And it's at times like these when Jesus gives us the other key on our key ring, the key that looses, the key that opens the gates of heaven to repentant sinners. As verse 18 says, whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, all of our worship services begin the same way. Every single week, we start with the confession and absolution. During that time, we all confess our sins before God. We say, we are all together sinful from birth. In countless ways, we have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your children. And then something truly incredible happens. The pastor turns and says, God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. We do it every week, so we might not even think about it all that much. But how amazing is it that we can tell one another, your sins are forgiven. And it is as good and certain as if Jesus was the one standing here telling it to us. When I turn and I announce that to you, announce the forgiveness of your sins, 
That's not empty words. It's effective. And not because I'm powerful, not because I'm holy enough to forgive your sins, but because the one who gives us this power and gives us this key, he is the one powerful enough and effective enough and merciful enough to bring it about and to forgive you of your sins. And this key belongs to you as well. As a justified child of God, you have been given the authority to forgive sins to those who are sinning. This means that if a troubled sinner, a friend, or a family member comes to you and confesses a certain sin that's been weighing on them, that's been troubling them, you can reassure them that with God, it's all right. His blood has cleansed them from all sin. If a child comes to you with tear-stained eyes and apologizes and says they're sorry, you can grab them by the shoulders and say, it's okay. Your sin is forgiven. In fact, Jesus came and died on the cross to take away that sin. What a joyous thing to be able to use this unlocking key to show people that, yes, the gates of heaven are open to them. Even in spite of their sin, God has forgiven them. Think about the parable of the prodigal son. In that parable, you have the, you have the son who leaves and, and squanders away all his father's wealth. And once he becomes um, sorrowful and realizes that he sinned, he goes back to his father. But the father doesn't wait for him to come and grovel at his feet. The father runs and with tears in his eyes embraces his son, joyful that the son that had been lost was now found. We're all the prodigal son. There's not a single one of us that isn't guilty of sin. And we have numerous pet sins that we fall into every single day, like greed and gossip and lust and anger and hatred, and, and the list goes on and on and on. But when we turn to the Lord with a sin-stricken heart, with a heart that tells us we are guilty, this is when we can rejoice in the ministry of the keys because God looks at us and sometimes through the mouth of someone else, he assures us our sins are forgiven. With tears in his eyes, he embraces you, rejoicing that you who were once lost have now been found. As 1 John chapter 3 says, when our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart. He is able to forgive he is able to unlock heaven for sinners like you and me. And that's what he's done. So the keys, they're in our hands. Now, if you think back when you first got your, the keys to the family car from your parents, that was probably an exciting time. But if you're like me, you were also probably rather nervous. You know, driving in a car by yourself for the very first time, that's pretty scary. Before, you were relying on the, the passenger in the seat next to you to be able to point out if someone was coming through the lane or coming into your lane or things like that. So it's scary to be all alone with the family's car keys. With the keys that Jesus has given you, however, you can take joy and comfort in knowing that you're never alone. Jesus tells us in the last verse of our text, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. So as you're using these keys, when someone has fallen into some sin, and you need to go to them and explain their sin to them and show them where they've gone wrong, Jesus is there with you. He's giving weight to your words, and he's blessing them. And when you have fallen into sin, and you feel the despair of your guilt, and you go to someone else and confess your sins and ask for forgiveness, Jesus is there as well. He's extending his hands to you, and he says, Look at my hands and my side. See the scars on my feet. I died for that sin. I've taken it away. You are forgiven. May the Lord grant us the faithfulness to be able to appreciate the use of these keys and to go and willingly Use both of these keys out of love for our fellow Christians. In Jesus' saving name, amen.
please rise. And the peace of God, which surpasses all our understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank you.